And we are back on the Zero Hour. This is Richard R.J. Escow. And, you know, American exceptionalism isn't what it used to be. With the election of Donald Trump, we're going to have to get used to a phenomenon, a type of leadership that is, in fact, not unique in the world, even if it's unusual in recent American history. Uh, and here to talk about the international lessons uh, for us as we enter the era of Trump is John Pfeffer. John is the Director of Foreign Policy in Focus at the Institute for Policy Studies, and he has written a piece, a uh, recent piece, on what Europe can teach us about Trump since they've been uh, dealing with guys like him for a long time. John, first of all, thanks for coming on the program. Thanks for having me on your show. Uh, you bet. And I thought this was a very uh, useful piece, uh, given the historical moment we're in. And one of the points you make is, despite the you know seemingly American nature of, and and genuinely American nature of Trump as huckster, as phenomenon, as Huey Long character, whatever, Dusty Rhodes from uh, from a face in the crowd, the great movie. You could see a lot of American cultural and historical citations for him, but you make the point that as a national leader, as a head of a country, Europe has dealt with guys like him before. Well, what are your basic thoughts on that? Yeah, <clears throat> well, you know, the, the conditions that produced Donald Trump, again, seem, like you said, to be uh, peculiarly American. I mean, people talk about the Rook Belt. They talk about Steve Bannon and the alt-right. They talk about reality show. Uh, the entrepreneurial kind of genius of Donald Trump. But all of that has been uh, seen before in Europe. Uh, for instance, uh, Silvio Berlusconi in Italy. I mean, his, his career seems almost to have followed Donald Trump uh, before Donald Trump ever got off the ground. Uh, Berlusconi, too, was, uh, got his start in real estate. He was a media mogul, he was a womanizer. He didn't censor his, his thoughts. Uh, people thought he was a clown, and yet he won. And not only did he win, but he hung around for nearly 20 years until corruption finally brought him down. Uh, so that's one example. But in my piece, I talk about some more recent examples in Hungary, in Poland, and in Slovakia as well. You know, I was interested in, and we can get back to Berlusconi. Other people have made the Berlusconi comparison too, but you dived into it in, in, in uh, somewhat more depth. Uh, the Hungary uh, and Eastern Europe interested me because I was actually, I spent a lot of time in Hungary between 88 and 1988 and 1992, the time period you talk about there, and also less amount, but some time in Poland and Slo Slovakia. I, I knew something of what was going on with Hungary. It's terrifying. Less so with Poland and Slovakia, so it was interesting. We'll get to that. But in terms of Hungary, you know, Hungary, ha the Hungarians, as you know, because I think you've spent a lot of time there too, have had a self-image for a long time, as we may have here in the States, of being cultured, of being democratic. They lived under communism for many years, but you know, a country that was internationalist in its thinking, a sophisticated, educated population, and so on. So I don't think, I think it came as a surprise to a lot of people inside Hungary that its ruling party became so popular, moved so sharply towards authoritarianism, and yet, if anything, retained its popularity, right? Absolutely. And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, Budapest, the capital of, of Hungary, uh, with, where about 20% of the population lives, is, is like the cosmopolitan ideal. And it's been the cosmopolitan ideal since the 19th century. Uh, and most people who go to Hungary, of course, go to Budapest, and, and they're just charmed by the kind of uh, fantasy of the uh, culture, the, the coffee houses, the intellectuals, all the bookstores. But that's only one small part of, of Hungary. Hungary has a huge countryside, a huge agriculture, cultural population and a very conservative countryside. And the Hungarians talk about it as a kind of urban, uh, rural split. And that was basically kind of uh, papered over after 1989. And after 1989, there was a great consensus that the society wanted to kind of get rid of communism and move toward the European Union, uh, move toward kind of market democracy. Uh, and 
people didn't realize that the, the rift between the urban and the rural didn't disappear. It just kind of went dormant for a few years. And Viktor Orban, who was the head of a, a very liberal party, uh, the Alliance of Young Democrats, Fidesz, he realized that there was great political opportunity. He was also very angry that the socialists and, and the, the other liberal party, the Alliance of Free Democrats, had teamed up, had formed a kind of coalition government in the mid-90s. That really angered him. And he decided he'd abandon liberalism and seek out greener pastures over on the right side of the political spectrum. And that was an incredibly wise political move on his part because that was, it was basically uncontested territory over there. He took his party, Fidesz, over to the right. He appealed to all the folks outside of Budapest who were disappointed with what had happened happened in Budapest, in Hungary after 1989. And the same kind of, if you will, Rust Belt um, uh, kind of dynamic emerged in Hungary. A lot of people who felt as if the economic changes that had taken place, uh, whether you want to call it neoliberalism or globalization or simply market reform, had left those folks behind, had not benefited them. And Fidesz, um, side of the spectrum developed a kind of populist economic policy that appealed to those people a great deal. Well, and, and that gets to a great point. And by the way, John, I remember with the fall of communism, the first signs of, for example, anti-Semitism and nativism coming out because, you know, that speech wasn't allowed under, uh, under communism. And the kind of shock that went along with that, uh, the kind of emergence of this bigoted speech that you know we're all too familiar with in this country but it, it kind of gets to an important point here which is and we can talk about the other countries as well but the notion that when you're pushing neoliberal policies that really don't help working people rural people what have you that one alternative obviously there's left populism or left reform but this kind of nativist uh, anti-immigrant uh, right-leaning populism that doesn't get to the economic source of their distress seems to be a go-to position everywhere in the world right now mm -hmm. under the right circumstances. And it looks like we're not going to get our lesson anytime soon from Hungary as to how to get out of that loop. That's right. And I mean, you make an important point, and that is that at the beginning of those changes in 1989-1990, there's a parallel here in the United States the extremist positions that, uh, that came to the foreground, the racist, the anti-Semitic, uh, the xenophobic comments that appeared, were dismissed as being fringe, as being just a few discontents out on the fringes. And uh, the, the, the liberal parties kind of blithely went forward with economic reforms that, in some sense, uh, did not benefit both the, the general population, the large kind of uh, number of folks in the countryside, but particularly did uh, serve as a flashpoint for some of the more extremist elements. In the same sense uh, as what happened in the Soviet Union under Mikhail Gorbachev, Gorbachev introduced his policy of Osnos, of speaking freely, and there was this perception somehow that only kind of nice liberal people would take advantage of freedom of speech, right. and they'd say nice things. Um, but in fact, what turned out in both the Soviet Union and in Yugoslavia and Eastern Europe was that this kind of new freedom of speech was taken over very quickly by nationalists, extremists, racists, and they took advantage very quickly and they built a movement based uh, at, in that period. And it all kind of uh, hit us, and when I say us, I mean kind of liberal, cosmopolitan types, uh, the back of the head. We didn't really see it coming. It blindsided us. Uh, and the same can be said about the United States as well, uh, that the so-called alt-right, the neo-Nazi, the extreme racist, you know, we associated that with David Duke. They were not politically viable, yet somehow they did prove uh, influential beyond their numbers. And we're talking with John Pfeffer, Director of Foreign Policy and Focus at the Institute for Policy Studies. You know, it's, John, it's funny that you use the word cosmopolitan because I remember 
when all this was going on, seeing in the papers and elsewhere, you know, quote, people, politicians, not Fidesz yet, except the right wing of Fidesz, but politicians and others talking about getting rid of crushing the cosmopolitan element in Hungary. And I asked people what they meant, and they said Jews. Um, right. So you have and that. You see that here in the United States as well. I mean, I can't tell you how many times George Soros has appeared in the kind of the negative comments section of uh, articles uh, across the board, mainstream, left and right. And George Soros stands in for cosmopolitan Jew, stands in for everything that is transnational, everything that is internationalist, everything that is elite. And ultimately, if you boil it down to its, its crudest element, the protocols of the elders of Zion. Right, right. they've got all the money, they're going to, you know. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's appalling and horrifying. And John, I, I, I thought your article is a great contribution. I have to say, uh, in terms of examples, successful examples, you know, Berlusconi, very Trump-like in many ways, was around for 20 years. Uh, Fidesz still going strong. I can't say that Europe has necessarily given us successful models for uh, vanquishing this sort of thing, but are there lessons we can learn to try to kind of combat Trumpism and, and, and create a, a different kind of politics in this country, you think? Well, I do, do think that the, perhaps the most successful example would be Slovakia and what uh, Slovaks were able to do to kind of overcome Vladimir Mečiar, who was a, one of the early populists, came to power in the mid-90s in that country. And essentially what happened was, you know, the, uh, the liberal elements, the left elements, even the centrist elements become complacent in Slovakia. They just mm -hmm. assume that history was going to march in a certain direction. And Vladimir Mečiar was this big wake-up call. And you could say the same thing here in the United States. I think people thought, hey, you know, Barack Obama, first African-American president. Hillary Clinton, she'll be the first woman president. History is marching in, in the right direction. And we were slammed again, you know, blindsided to realize, hey, history never marches in one direction. It always, as President Obama said, zigzags. And this should be our similar wake-up call as in Slovakia. They organize. They organize at, across the level, uh, across society, uh, in building a movement both at a very narrow political, um, uh, in a very narrow political way to kind of uh, win in the following elections, but also in a more broad-based way and kind of mobilize the constituencies that were most adversely affected by Vladimir Mečiar's policies. I think the same kind of two-pronged strategy uh, presents itself to us here in the United States. On the one hand, you know, a simple calculation says, hey, all we got to do is, you know, win, uh, say 100 to 200,000 votes in those three key states that Hillary Clinton lost. We get back the Rust Belt, Democrats go on and win. But it's far more complicated sure. than that because, of course, you know, we want to see a, a somewhat different Democratic Party. We want to mobilize constituencies to transform the agenda of the Democratic Party as well. Yeah, I think this election, among other things, was, was evidence at all electoral levels that the, the, the compromised Democratic Party agenda is not going to sway people over and that you know, Democrats need to win state houses to draw a fairer congressional districts or they won't win Congress back, on and on and on. So a number of reforms are needed to the Democrats' own policies and to make our political process more democratically responsive. But uh, uh, this is a great, at least we know what our work is now. So I guess that's a clarifying moment for us and your your article was certainly uh, a great contribution to that so thanks for writing that and john pfeffer of the institute for policy studies uh, also thanks for coming on the program thank you for having me on your show and we will be right back after this i am richard rj escal and this is the zero hour